Greetings from Metaverse. My name is Juuso Pekkinen and I am a host of the first ever Blow Your Mind event by Yle Innovations. In this webinar, we are going to talk about synthetic media. What do we talk about when we talk about synthetic media? Is it something that will change the way we do and experience the media? If so, how and when? You are going to meet experts working with virtual persons, digital twins and synthesized audio. You are also going to hear what kind of legal, ethical and practical questions we might have to ask about this field of technology. But the most important question is, where do you find hosts who are as handsome, fluent and natural as me? To tell you more about how we made me happen, let me pass it to my sidekick, Juuso. Työergonomiahan pitäisi olla kunnossa. Sellaisen planeetan, joka eroaa vähän isommin siitä, minkälainen tämä meidän oma kotiplaneettamme on. Siis, miltä esimerkiksi tämän eksoplaneetan pinnalla näyttää ja minkälainen sää tai olosuhteet siellä kenties vallitsee? Oh, and uh, by the way, one important thing, the dog is called Pepi. He's an Instagram star, and if you're interested, search Pikkuhauva, little doggy in English. Uh, anyway, the closet, uh, great sound quality. If you're ever going to be interviewed into a podcast remotely, go to a closet. That's the best place. So uh, I did something like, I don't know, dozens, 50, 60 interviews from the closet. I actually, I once interviewed Santeri Suominen, who's working uh, as an XR curator here in Finland in Helsinki XR Center, Center, and we were talking about VR and technological side of the technology, and we decided to do the interview for my podcast inside VR, using alt space. So I was sitting in a closet for t three, four hours, with the VR headset on, and that was weird, but it was also awesome. And one day, I did this very, very, very special recording. I recorded myself reading a book for one hour, and my producer, Sami, who's actually also here, there's Sami. Hi, Sami. Sami did same, same text, one hour, one recording, and we took those recordings and we sent those files to Ukraine. And that's where the real magic happens. And today, you're gonna hear more about it. 
after our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is super experienced. He's been working with media, entertainment industry and technology. Please welcome John Canning. Well, welcome uh, everyone and I wish I could be there with you. Um, but sadly, can't make it over to Finland at this time. So we're doing this remotely. But I guess as we're talking about digital characters and synthetic beings, being remote kind of makes sense. So let me share uh, a little presentation that I put together with you. So when we talk about synthetic humans, let's face it, there's so many ways to think about it. Digital human, virtual human, synthetic human, artificial being, avatar, hologram, digital twin. It can go on and on and on. But there's a couple of fundamental things about what are we talking about? We've been talking about and telling stories since the caveman and the cave woman could draw on with charcoal and tell stories about their friends and their hunts and, and create characters. And sometimes a little hard to tell what it was, but uh, I think I can make out the person and I think I can make out the, the animal. And we've progressed in telling these kinds of stories and leaving these as, as artifacts for others or having others join in telling those stories. But we've created characters. You think about a play you've watched and a person getting dressed up and being somebody else and being a, a type of character for a brief period of time. And then telling a story, creating a saga, creating drama, taking you and transporting you to a different time and a different belief space. And it has a stage. And these stages are where we tell these stories. What I think is fascinating about our age and, and as we grow, the stages become so much more interesting and so much more flexible. But let's think, let's break it down. What are we talking about? What we're talking about is a story, some kind of performance, and that stage. Now let's turn back the clock. I don't know how many of you have ever played uh, MUD, multi-user dungeon. There's any names for these. But back in college, I was logging into a server. I was sitting here, and this happens to be a mush, uh, and playing a game with other people where this was as sophisticated as the graphics got. But it was compelling. I had friends. We played games. We played a game that was an ongoing world um, and continued to grow and, and to develop as we went. But you know what? Then along came the web, then along came Vermal. And I feel like I have to tip the hat to Tony Parisi, Mark Pesci and team, because it was virtual reality markup language. So sure enough, back in the 90s, we were already starting to think about a spatial web, spatial computing thinking about how do we represent things more than just text on a page. Now, if you go and check out the Web3D Consortium, you'll see how that's progressed. But standards around, hey, how do we make a 3D version of the thing that's a, a search engine? And then Second Life. Now, there's other uh, areas to, to point to and other groups to talk about. And Second Life, to me, is one of those areas where it was an open world, open universe concept. You could build worlds, you could build lands, you could build games within inside games. You built characters. You had companies on the internet and brick and mortar stores building virtual brick and mortar stores in this environment, advertising in it, uh, being able to create a character and dress that character up and engage and interact with your peers. It even had its own economy. So. You think about what people are talking about, blockchain and crypto, and you realize, you know, these are new iterations of things that we've been doing for quite some time. What we've added though, is the technology and the tools to make it bigger, better, faster. Uh, somebody even pointed out to me, they were like, oh yeah, Second Life was great, but I was into Havo Hotel. Again, 
a place where people would find and gravitate towards it if you look at the graphics it wasn't trying to be hyper real it wasn't trying to be something it wasn't but again it was about the stories that people were telling the stage that they were on and the performances that they were making i always like to point out to folks when they start talking about uh, different universes and things like that world of warcraft massively massively um, multiplayer online world where people are engaged and playing with each other and the fascinating thing is this person doesn't look like this in real life but you have no idea what they look like what gender they are what sexual orientation they are it just doesn't matter it is about engaging with their friends and their peers and enjoying themselves and and living a, a different life these kinds of things, when I mean, you think about the characters, it's not hyper real, it's fantasy, but it fits very well into that environment. Then you can even think about mixing the real and the, uh, the, the augmented in an augmented reality like a Pokemon Go that literally swept the world. And if you think about Pokemon Go and the activities that people in real life wandering around capturing different Pokemon and playing and exploring. You know, there were people that were claiming they finally had a, a way to go get exercise that they'd never really thought about before. So this blending of the real and the augmented. Roblox. Again, is this character necessarily hyper real? No, but it fits into that environment. And Roblox being a world, a set of worlds, where people are creating and telling stories and interacting. Can't have a discussion without talking about things like Fortnite. And then you see the blend, and we saw over the, pan the time of the pandemic, where a gaming environment also became a concert environment. And again, is this a hyper real character? No. It's a character that is stylized to fit the world. And you find different people gravitating towards different looks and different um, activities, uh, you know, gaming, music, a mixture of these worlds. And the play, they don't necessarily bring, um, di you know, music. They try to match the music and the performances to their audience. And so again, it's about sort of a universe that's created for that entertainment and that kind of fun. I have to point out that things like Fortnite then started branching out. Recently hosted probably somewhat controversial, you now it was controversial, um, MLK, Dr. Martin Luther King experience. But the team felt super passionate about being able to introduce a generation and a group of people that may not be as familiar with Dr. King and his legacy uh, and tried now, maybe they didn't do it perfectly, but they did try. And they did try to think about how to bring this to an audience that may not have ever really tuned into that. And to be able to think about how they're going to do more of those. So an experiment, an evolution beyond a music concert, but you have to think about how they're gonna really do and what they're gonna do next. And most of us have probably met up in some virtual conference environment, Altspace, Rendezvous, Real, and so many of different flavors and styles, but with this goal of being able to put people into a virtual environment, enable them to interact. And I think what you start to find out is what's challenging about that? You know, what do you like about interacting with your peers and, and meeting new people? And how does that translate to a digital environment and a digital world? And how do you bring that character to it? And if you know you look at this, there's avatars of all different shapes and sizes and probably a standard avatar and then a customized avatar. But we've seen the evolution of these kind of platforms, certainly during the pandemic, because we had to meet like this. We weren't meeting physically. And so it pushed the boundaries of what we could do and how we interact.
But I think it also really pointed out to us the importance of understanding how to interact and what is meaningful about that. And, you know, walking up to a, in a virtual environment, walking up to a 3D character that is staring off into space, it is disconcerting. You want contact, you want eye contact. What we found in you know, a lot of video conferencing where we're looking at each other and talking to each other is there is that meaningful connection. But you saw even things like Burning Man, a huge festival in the American desert go virtual and people bring their shared experiences and art and collective to an online environment because they had to. And then this year they did a hybrid version so the experiment of the real uh, and the virtual, and how do they fall, how do they flow together? Can't help but talk again about the concept of Zoom, Teams, Meets, all these different ways that we're interacting with each other as a community, coming together for different reasons, for meetings, for family, for good causes, um, but there's something real and visceral about this. And each one of these people have, you can see their identity and individuality and they can bring it forth. And I think as we think about digital characters, we have to be able to do that as well. I grabbed one avatar creator screen from one of the online platforms just to show the start of what people are thinking about. But the reality is we want to get more sophisticated. MetaHuman Creator by Unreal. The ability to create these characters and start to push real fidelity and the, the uniqueness of these type of characters so that you have an online persona that, or, or creating a character that could be very unique. Our friends over at NVIDIA with different technology platforms and the the audio to face where if you're speaking or taking audio, it's driving a face, it's puppeting a face. So to give that, that feeling of, of the mouth and the, and the face moving naturally and any number of technologies and different companies working on how to bring that performance to light. Mocap or motion capture in a number of different ways, whether it be on a big stage and you know multiple people in dots, or an accent suit, or even the technology from Radical where a single camera and giving a skeleton and, and giving movement. And I, and I have to tip the hat to my former employer and friends over at Digital Domain. Again, using an accent suit, AR kit, breathing life into characters and be giving it movement and freedom and to think about how do we emote and how do we interact. Again, our friends at Digital Domain doing brilliant work, hyper real characters, and then simulating even down to the clothing to give that realism, that fidelity when you want it. So to think about how we're developing characters and what we want them to be. My friend Doug Robel here demonstrating the Masquerade 2 system from Digital Domain and facial capture where the facial capture is translated to a digital version of a person and you're going for that subtlety that fidelity the fact that you can see the real human with the dots on his face blinking a lot and you can see his digital character mimicking the blinking but also the uh, ability to track the eyes so that if you're looking at that person that person is looking back at you and let's not forget audio and creating voices. Um, I, I grabbed uh, some examples from a company called Well Said, Respeacher, any number of great companies out there doing more with synthetic voice, creating the ability to, how do you have your digital character say something? So having Wade. Creating a believable character is hard. Not only do they need to look right, act right, but also sound right. Or Alana. Creating a believable character is hard. Not only do they need to look right, act right. So having the ability to create a sentence and then have two different voices, multiple voices, be able to say that. 
Then there's the moving into AI and having AI drive a character and giving it a personality. Folks like Replica and others where they're creating a digital persona and then giving that digital persona life. My friends over at Charisma.ai have been doing a lot of different fun, and they have an engine for driving story. Now, what they did is they did a bit of an experiment. They grabbed some metahumans, and then they said, well, let's do a little interaction with them. So we'll play this video so that you can see a little bit of their experimenting. But if you look under the hood, Charisma.ai is about sophisticated story and character interaction. Hey you. Hey me? Yeah you. Wanna see some magic? Oscar really? Come on. Who doesn't want to see they magic? I want to see your tricks. Sorry, it's your call. I'm Kara and this is Oscar. Oh hey Kara, hey Oscar. My name's Tom. Come on. Who doesn't want to see magic on such a beautiful day in May? Good point. I'd quite like to see some magic. Good to hear, Tom. But first, I need to know how long we've got. What station are you getting off at? I'm getting off at Grand Central Station. So you're a local? Yeah. So just a little bit of a snippet of what it was like to have a real human interacting with digital characters. And what the team over at Charisma Data AI discovered is that the challenge is of making a character move in a believable way so they can provide the dialogue. But now you need to make that face move in a way that is believable and understandable. All of these subtle things come together. Now, Madison Beers, doing a project with friends over at Sony where they are creating beautiful music videos with an all digital version of Madison and the environment. So now let's watch this for a little bit, just to see an example of the fidelity and the look of what they're creating. So all digital, digital character, a model of a real venue, Sony Hall. Um, and I thought the next video was just a little bit, and we don't have to play all of it, um, but just a little bit, you'll get a glimpses of it. Um, I would leave the audio down um, and just see some glimpses of Madison in a mocap suit and some of the elements that came together. So let's go ahead and play that video. Putting together a virtual concert like this is like a machine developing the newest technologies for entertainment. Sony has many amazing technologies when paired up with a creative vision, enable an entirely new category of immersive entertainment. When I first learned about this, I was really excited and really intrigued. I think that this is giving a really awesome opportunity to be super creative with concerts. First, we work with Madison to define a look in 3D. Then she goes into our scanning session and then we reconstruct and build that. The challenge with creating a virtual rock star is that you really have to pay attention to those subtle things. That moment where the performer locked eyes with you, that's something you're going to remember. Then we put her hypermodel into a video game engine. Everything that she did was transferred real time into my virtual reality headset. And so I was talking to her hypermodel in 3D and she was talking back to me. When I performed it, even though it was in a virtual world, I felt like I was at a concert for those 10 minutes. We're able to see her and light her and put her into Sony Hall. Sony Hall is really the ideal concert venue for VR. There's a closeness to it and an intimacy, but it's also got a fair amount of dimension in all directions. Sony is really excited to inspire young creators. We want them to understand that marrying technology and creative enables an entirely new type of experience and that we want them to be the next creators. Yeah, I think that this is the new era of technology. It's just so cool to bend these restrictions that we have between what is real and what is not. 
I hope you all really enjoy the experience and don't forget that merch is in the back. So as you saw a, uh, a experience there where all the elements came together that I was talking about. And in that case, AI isn't driving the character, a real human is driving the character. And dancing and singing and bringing all of those a virtual environment together and creating a performance. Um, what you can imagine is the next step is when we start doing that real time and still continue to maintain that fidelity. Now, I feel like I have to mention this because everybody wants to talk about it. But when I call it the M word or the metaverse, Neil Stevenson wrote about that in 1992 and was creating a world that, well, frankly, you could think about similar to what they talked about in Ready Player One. And if you think about it, Ready Player One had sort of a dystopian view of a virtual environment that was run by a megacorp and really needed to be overthrown at some point. It's kind of interesting. Parallels, kind of frightening. But the idea of different kinds of characters in an environment where they could mix and match and be of different shapes and sizes and things like that, we're all thinking about. And we're thinking about how to create those characters. Friends over at the Entertainment Technology Center at USC have been working on a project called the Universal Character Model, for example. And I loved how they defined the thought about, well, we have to come up with a way to common, like back in the days of Vermal, be able to create a digital environment, open standards. Well, how are we gonna create a character and have it live in different worlds and maybe move around to different environments? So I think it's interesting to think about all of these elements have to come together as we continue to progress this forward. And, you know, we talked about a bit of the dystopian future and we talked about it, but we have to think about our digital likeness. And I took the picture of this when I was going to an event and you'll notice that the presence, uh, you understand that all the photography, filming and or recording will be done in re uh, reliance of this consent given by you by entering this area, and you agree to release the releases from any liability on account of such usage. So if I could film you and I can create a digital character from that, did you just give your consent by going to an event? It kind of makes you think. We have to think about our identity. A friend of mine, Dimitri Shapiro, running a company, was writing recently, and I just love this statement, where he said, few of us have a canonical digital identity. I was like, whoa, he's right. I've got a digital character in one game, I've got a presence in a social media, but nothing is like my standard me in my identity. And I think we have to start thinking about that in our representation. So I encourage you to think about how will you represent yourself in this new digital world? I thank you and I appreciate you listening and I hope you have a great day. Thanks everybody. It's been great. And again, I wish I could be with all of you. Hopefully soon we will be, but this is me and my virtual self signing off saying, have a great day. Thank you, John Canning. Uh, sorry, we had some difficulties with the technology. <laughs> so sorry about that. And if you're watching the stream from YouTube, please use the chat function. So if you have any thoughts, any idea you'd like to share, please feel, feel free to do so. And especially if you have any questions to our speakers, please send those from the, via the chat. Because next speakers are going to, we're going to have a Q&A after every speak, so give us some questions. Uh, I told you about the audio files me and my producer, Sami, sent to Ukraine. Those files, one hour long, same text, 
And what happened after that? Well, we sent those files to Ukraine for a company called Respeacher, whose team has been focused on high-fidelity voice cloning. Alex Serdiuk, what happened after your team received our files? Do we have Alex? Okay, cool. Alex, are you there? I'm here. And responding to your question, so right after we got your data, we basically did our magic. We trained our system to understand difference between those vocal timbers you sent to us. And then the system was ready to do conversions. So it was ready to convert from one speaker into another. Cool. Everybody, please welcome our next speaker, CEO and founder of Free Speecher. Yeah, it's great to be here. I hope you can see my presentation, right? So I'm Alex, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Respeacher. And what we do at Respeacher, we let one voice sound exactly like another voice. And that's called speech-to-speech uh, -speech voice conversion, but we simplify that to voice cloning. Uh, one of the recent projects we were a part of was Mandalorian, and I assume most of the audience have seen that and this unexpected appearance of young Luke Skywalker. And then just in this August, um, Disney revealed that voice of Mark Hamill was completely synthesized using the speecher. So basically we did a uh, voice that was resonating with audience for like 40 years. And many people remembered this particular vocal timber uh, Mark Hamill had back then and it was great to see like old men were crying and uh, some some people were some big um, big number of people were so excited to feel young again uh, another big project project you might have seen we were part of and we did together with digital domain 72 and sunny uh, with NFL where we brought back Vince Lombardi and Digital Domain did their magic on creating a virtual human and hologram um, and we participated in making the sound. Please play this demo. In the wake of the most tumultuous year in modern American history, we brought back the one coach that knew what to say when we've been knocked down. With 96 million Americans watching, the NFL wanted the 55th Super Bowl to be a moment to rally and unite the country. Introducing As One, the Lombardi Comeback, an innovative approach to bring back Vince Lombardi, American football's most inspiring head coach, for a first-of-its-kind integration into the live Super Bowl broadcast. Proprietary AI software took weeks to analyze scarce hours of footage to replace a stage actor's face and mimic the nuanced performance. And his speech was compiled of famous but never heard before quotes. We brought these words to life with voice cloning technology that used machine learning to blend a computer simulated voice with an actor's voice to achieve the most emotional and accurate delivery. Because it's not whether we get knocked down. Because it's not whether we get knocked down. Because it's not whether we get knocked down. The comeback crescendo as the introductory film seamlessly blended into the live Super Bowl broadcast. Coordinating with over a dozen in-stadium cameras, the Jumbotron and directed attention to a virtual Coach Lombardi standing on the field, speaking directly to Americans for the first time in over 50 years. Because it's not whether we get knocked down, but whether we get back up. As one. The nation found inspiration in Coach Lombardi's words, which helped account for 2.1 billion earned impressions and gave Coach Lombardi new life in American culture. Yeah, they partied hard in Tampa. One girl was so drunk she made out with the Vince Lombardi hologram. Bringing all of us closer together.
Yeah, so th this was an amazing project and just, just recently, a few days ago, it won quite significant award, a Clio award in advertising. Um, I'll, I'll talk here a bit more about the technology and this slide would show you the difference between quite popular text-to-speech technologies out there and stuff that we are doing that would be speech-to-speech. -speech. So uh, there, are, there are two challenges with text-to-speech when you try to convert voice from just text input. And the main problem is it, it always sounds robotic to some extent and it does not give you control over the performance. And the thing is, we humans are the best in terms of perform. We know how to act with our voice uh, since, since we, were, we were born, but also we are best in terms of being guided how to, be, how to perform. Um, also, our system uh, does not use any language models, and that would be also a limitation of text-to-speech systems, because when you use language model, you use vocabulary. When you use vocabulary, you are tied to particular words that are known in this vocabulary, but our speech consists not only of words, but also of some things that, that would be in non-wording um, domain, as well as we can do singing, we can do crying, we can do whispering, all this kind of stuff uh, is challenging to convert using text to speech. However, text to speech is extremely scalable because you have no humans in the loop. With speech to speech, you always need someone to perform. And with our particular system, we do not change performance at all. We change only timber. So if you need to impersonate someone, you would need to speak exactly like this person would speak in terms of pace, emotions, emphasizes, and stuff. Uh, there are five main steps how our technology works, and it all starts with getting permission from voice owner to clone their voice. And we uh, require our clients to have a written permission, and we actually ask for a copy of that permission to be in place. Uh, then we need to collect target voice and source voice data. And by target, we mean someone we impersonate, and source voice would be usually an actor who drives the target voice. Then we do our magic. We basically take this, those audio files and we train our system. That's quite heavy system that requires quite a lot of GPU power to understand all those tiny differences between particular vocal timbers. And then once system is trained, usually it takes up to two weeks, uh, it's ready to convert data. It's ready to take new recordings from source speaker and get it converted to a target voice. And that would be a simple diagram of the process. We took Grant's voice as a source speaker. We took Daniel's voice as a target voice. We trained our system. Grant did new recordings and that was converted into Daniel's voice. And please play the demo. Hi, I'm Grant, a co-founder of Respeacher. In a minute, you'll see a video of Daniel Cohn, the head of Lyft Labs, and then you'll see a video where I speak in Daniel's voice. You are listening to the Ideas Elevated podcast of Comcast NBC Universal Lyft Labs. The system captures the idiosyncrasies of how I say something each time I say it. I can say the same thing many times, the same thing many times, the same thing many times, and each time the recording will be correspondingly different. There are plenty of use cases we cover with our technology and it's, it, it all started in media creation. However, uh, during the development of our technology, we found use cases in our other areas. And it's all about basically detaching a human from their voice or even more a human from the voice they have in a particular moment of their life because we do quite a lot of de-aging projects uh, where an actor needs to speak in the voice he had back then. Um, we do work in dubbing and localization where we basically simplify processes of localizing content, um, make it faster in terms of time to market because you can exchange all local actors with their voices and some high demand actors can scale themselves to some lower demand actors. Uh, there are cases like voice of brand where you have a particular voice that needs to be used in many, many media, but this person would be available at most 24 per seven. And in many cases, it's not 
uh, it's not enough. And also there are cool cases when voices that are not professionally trained to be voice actors, like athletes, uh, can be driven by someone who is professionally trained to be voice actor. So you can listen to audio book narrated by a famous athlete uh, in a professional way. Uh, so technology allows keep voices consistent. It allows quite significant scalability in terms of particular high demand voices. It allows creative flexibility because now you're not tied to, to actors and you can also create something where you get voices from the past and we do work in quite a few documentaries when we bring historical figures back uh, to, to act in the content. Uh, it reduces time to market, as I said, and there are plenty of cases when we have to work with voices of kids because, I mean, first, it's quite challenging to find kids make them sit still and do recordings, especially if you have a tight schedule. But the most challenging part that their voice can drastically change within months. Uh, we, we have a project right now when a boy goes through a massive puberty, but boy is quite important character for, for a game. And creators, they need to keep same actor, they need to keep same performer, but voice is not available. So we enable a boy who just turned 15 speaking the voice he had two years ago. Uh, when we talk about this technology, we always talk about ethics. Uh, we have our respeachers guidelines on how we operate. And as I said, we always start with making sure that there is permission in, pla in place. So we do not allow any deceptive uses of our technology and we cannot work without permission. Uh, but that's our technology and there, there are a lot of um, things going on by other people creating similar technologies and in order to protect the society from misuse of technology like ours, we spend quite a lot of time to educate people that such kind of technologies do exist and at some point uh, they might be used for bad in bad actors' hands. Uh, we also do participate in some detection uh, initiatives where companies build technologies that can detect synthesized audio or synthesized video. Uh, there is some important part of the work that needs to go uh, soon, and that would be working with content gatekeepers that would adopt this kind of detection technologies but also watermarking is important part when companies that create synthetic speech or synthetic video can watermark their content and you can easily tell say respeech or generated content from any other content uh, we do not provide any public api so no one can just go and clone someone's particular voice uh, we work with big studios mostly um, and written content from the from talents is something that uh, that should be obligatory in place. Uh, I'll talk here about one more project with Michael York. You might recognize Michael from Austin Powers or The Logan's Run. Um, and 15 years ago or a bit more, he was diagnosed with quite severe disease, amyloidosis. And this disease um, is, not very, is not very popular, so it... It's rare, uh, but it's, it's very severe in terms of um, what, what happens to your, your health when you get amyloidosis. And when Michael was diagnosed with that, he understood that there is no enough awareness about amyloidosis out there. So he dedicated his amazing, very well-recognized voice to bring more attention to amyloidosis. And... Uh, just a few months ago, uh, the team that worked on this project reached out to us and said, look guys, we created those videos, but Michael right now is an old man. He does not have the voice he had back then. He spends a lot of time in hospital. He does not have proper recording conditions, but we learned much more about amyloidosis than we, learned, than we knew 15 years ago. So we need to implement some changes, keep keeping the voice the same. 
uh, we did this project pro bono. You can see a small video um, of the animation that was voice ordered by Michael York, and you can listen to it and try to find spots where Respeacher's voice has been gener generated, has been added. Please play this demo. Amyloidosis awareness. Throughout our lifetime, our DNA codes for the production of small molecules called proteins. These proteins provide the structure and function for nearly all of life's biological processes. Once proteins are made in our cells, they naturally fold into a particular shape. This shape allows for their specific function in the body. When proteins are folded properly, they work as they should, and we enjoy good health. When proteins are misfolded, it can impair our body's normal functioning and problems may arise over time. Our bodies are usually pretty good at identifying and removing abnormal proteins. In some cases, though, we either produce too much of the abnormal proteins for our bodies to handle, or we're not able to break down and clean up the proteins at all. Amyloidosis is just one class in a growing list of protein misfolding disorders. And let's now listen to what Michael had to say about the work we did in this project. Please play this audio. Hello, this is Michael York, and I'd like to say how very grateful I am to Reese Speecher for giving my words and work a whole new lease on life. The technique involved is as ingenious as it is amazing and promises an unlimited future for all those involved in voice work. With Respeacher, history comes almost miraculously alive again. I heartily and thankfully endorse this great product. I need to wrap up. There is one, one more project I wanted to briefly tell you about. We did back in 2019 when our technology was extremely heavy and it was very hard to operate. We worked with MIT to create a piece of alternative history to make Richard Nixon say the speech that was written in case if Apollo 11 mission goes wrong. And it was like an exhibition. So you come to the room, you see an old TV, you turn it on, you listen to some, you, you watch some old uh, advertisement pieces and then Nixon appears and he reads this very powerful speech. Um, and you can... You can feel how it would be in case if this mission fail. Um, and this piece just, just won an Emmy Award like a month ago. And that's quite exciting for us and for all the companies involved into the creating of Nixon. That's all I have to say today. Uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much for having me here and always here to answer your questions or discuss some creative ideas. I'm, I'm sure you would have some. Really, really interesting, as it, and especially the samples were really impressive. Uh, but are you the guy who's going to take my job? Or you think you, do, do you consider yourself as a kind of a creative enabler? Uh, it's, uh, it's obviously the second because we still need voice actors and we need permissions from voice owners, right? So voice actors are, are, are needed in case, in case our technology is being used and your permission as a voice owner is also needed. And the fact that permission is needed means that compensation would be in place. And for the audience, uh, now it's time to send some questions via chat if you're watching this from YouTube. So please those, give those questions to us. Uh, you mentioned the ethics side. Uh, and at your website, you're saying that you're developing a watermark uh, into your technology at the moment. But how far at Respeacher you have come in developing this authentication thing at the moment? Yeah, Watermark has been quite challenging for us. We're still working on it. And the main challenge is the balance you need to have in watermarking technology. So watermarking technology should, the watermark itself should not be hearable, right? So it shouldn't in, be injected in your content where you can hear it right away when you listen to it. But on other end, it 
should not be easily removable. And watermarking technologies has been widely used by companies that distribute content for quite a while, for like 20 years. But the thing is, it's not that hard to put watermark in 20 minutes clip in a whole movie that is distributed into the cinemas. But in our case, we often deal with very small clips, one phrase or just one word. And watermarking in such a small piece of content uh, is something we, we, we have to deal with. So that's still in our R&D. Okay. We have a question from the audience. Uh, this one's from Petya, and this is super interesting. Uh, can this be used by people who have lost a loved one and want to remember? Would this be an ethical challenge? Uh, yeah, we, we have such requests. Currently, our technology is extremely heavy and it's not very affordable for individuals. But it's obviously possible to do from technical point of view. So if you have recordings of your loved ones and uh, you have the whole family permission to recreate their voice, that could work. So grandkids could listen to the lullabies recorded by their granddad who, who already passed away. Timothy is asking, how did you get the permission to virtualize Vince Lamborghi's voice? The US has strict rules and regulations on virtualizing voices when it comes to people who are not alive anymore. Yeah, actually NFL owns the rights for Vince Lombardi and they have quite strict rules about what needs to be, what can be digitalized, what, what not. And the permission was in place, so they were involved into the process. And the source speaker, someone who drove that voice, uh, was someone who, um, who was chosen by um, representatives of Vince Lombardi estate. I told earlier earl that we did one hour recording, but someone's asked me, uh, asking how many sentences did you need for virtualizing a voice? Uh, do you have like minimum? Yeah, in many projects we had to work with much less than data than one hour. We feel comfortable if we have 30 minutes of speech recorded in good recording conditions. And that's not about particular number of words or script. We just need observations of the voice. What we care of is also emotional range in the data set. So the emotional range in both target and source data set should match uh, the emotional range you would have in conversions. That means that if you want to cry or sing, we need that kind of emotions be presented before we introduce voices to training. And one more last question. In your opinion, in what direction will voice synthesis develop in over next year and five years? Yeah, it's, it, it would obviously improve its fidelity. Text-to-speech systems become better and better. They require less and less data, as well as our technology does require less and less data. Uh, there are some additional cool features that are being developed, like cross-lingual conversion, and that means that when you listen to, when you watch a movie with Tom Hanks in Finnish, you would be able to hear original voice of Tom Hanks without any accent speaking Finnish. That's quite cool. And real-time voice cloning is something that's very close. That means that with a very tiny delay, like 300 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds, uh, we would be able to convert the voice uh, on the fly. And that opens a lot of opportunities in customer service, as well as new cool media opportunities, like, like online concerts. Alex Serdyuk, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. As you know, this event is brought to you by Yle Innovations. And now someone's asking, what is Yle Innovations? So uh, I asked this question from our colleagues inside Yle Innovations, and this is the answer I got. We recognize futures and inspire Yle, while E to move towards them through experimentation. And uncertainties and risks, okay. End of quote. I like it. 
And the big question of this whole event is, what are we talking about when we're talking about synthetic media? So with this question, I was also looking to Ulevi Innovations people, and I asked them to give me some mind map or hashtags of, or ideas of synthetic media they have. And they gave me like million terabits of things, and I was trying to compress this list to a little bit shorter. And this is the list I was uh, trying to compress. AI-generated media, deep fakes, uncanny valley, fake news, future presenters, future actors, future influencers, future assistants, creativity powered by generative adversarial networks, image synthesis, voice synthesis, text generation, gaming environments, ethical concerns, accountability, weird, fun, sci-fi. If you have anything to comment, please use the chat. Daniel Verten is head of creative in at Synthesia. Their technology just recently featured in 60 Minutes. Welcome, Daniel Verten. Thank you so much for having me, Yoni, and very excited to be with you all today. Let me just share my presentation with you and we can jump right in because as Yoni mentioned, there's much to unpack when it comes to synthetic media and I would love to tell you more about it. First of all, just to check, can you see my screen? Fantastic, thank you so much. So let's jump right in. Basically, video dominates communications today. People don't want to read boring PDFs. Consumers want TikTok. They want YouTube instead of text. And we already see that video is taking over. According to a Cisco forecast, 82% of the internet's traffic is already video, which I personally already fi find astonishing. And so, we do have a challenge with video, right? With traditional video. And that challenge is that video production is slow, complex, and costly to scale. It is slow because with all of the physical processes involved in video production, going from an idea to an actual video can take up to weeks, right? It is complex because you need specialist equipment, you need actors, you need specialist skills, either in the team or yourself, to be able to create the video. And then it is also costly because, again, going through that process again and again, which is a linear traditional video production process, can take quite some investment. Now, the good news is that at Synthesia, we're actually making video production easy, fast and scalable. And what I mean by that is that we, we have built a platform where you can simply log into your browser and create video in minutes. You simply select an avatar, you type your script, you hit generate video, and in two minutes, you have a fully photorealistic video. And given that we've turned cameras into code, it is a scalable solution. We will be talking about personalized video experiences as we go along. Now, just to give you a flavor for synthetic media and for Synthesia Studio, please do play the video for me. Welcome to Synthesia Studio. It's the first platform that allows you to create videos by simply typing in text. In this video, I'll give you a quick tour of the platform. On the videos panel, you can see all the videos you have created. Click a video to open up the videos page where you can share, download, duplicate, and delete your video. Click the create new video to create your first video. Type the video title, write your script, and click the listen button to listen to the preview. Hi, I am Jack. I will be your presenter today. Or you can upload your own audio. On the right side, select an actor, choose your framing, and adjust actor sizing. Choose a background or upload your custom background. And you can also add a professional looking design with our templates. When you're ready, just click generate video. And that's it.
And so we have taken processes that actually normally take weeks and we turn them into code and now you can create video in minutes. And we're already seeing quite some results with our clients. We see that they are reporting 80% reduced cost compared to traditional video. And we also know from research from MIT that video as a format is nine times more effective than text. Now, synthetic media, you know, as Yoni mentioned, there are so many aspects to it, right? But at the most basic level, when it comes to video, synthetic video just means that we've turned cameras into code, right? And once we take away all of the physical processes of cameras, studios, actors, and turn them into code, we get all of the benefits of software. Now, as you know, software scales with us and it's also iterative. So we have the option to take all of the benefits of, um, of software. We see this as a massive paradigm shift, actually. First, you know, we went from old media systems, right? Which were broadcast and based on mass distribution. In the last 20 years, new media, social media has taken over. And as such, it democratized distribution itself. This was all driven by the internet. And I'm sure that I don't need to give you an introduction to this. Now, the next step in the evolution of media is the era of synthetic media. And this is driven by AI and deep learning technology. And the big difference and the paradigm shift here is that it's not only distribution that is democratized, but creativity itself becomes democratized. And that is something that we're really excited about at Synthesia. Now, this is mind boggling for me as well, but the technology is going ridiculously fast. What you see on the left are the first GANs, first um, general adversarial networks, which, which were created. These were, you know, small images generated by machines. And what you see on the right is actually one of the custom avatars that we have already created for our clients today. You can tell the difference and it's just mind boggling how fast the, uh, the technology is going. And just to give you, you know, a sense what we believe is coming up. We do believe that in five years time, 90% of all video will be synthetic, right? We're quite into this progress already because it's so much simpler to create video in this way when it's generated by AI. Now, to give you an even further horizon for this, in 10 years time, anyone with a laptop and internet connection, enough time on their hands, will be able to create a Hollywood great movie. And the exciting part about this is that we're opening up creativity for everyone. We're making video accessible for all, right? We're Anyone who will just sit down and take the time with an idea to create a new story, they will be able to create a Hollywood great movie on their laptop. Now, the difference here and the one that we have been talking about in a five and 10 year horizon is that we're taking the difference from going from specialists to directors. Everyone is becoming a director. Up to now, for example, if you wanted to edit an image and change, let's say, the hair color in an image, you would go and paint pixel X, Y into red, right? Now, the difference is, is that you can just tell the machine, change the hair color from blonde to red, and it happens. And this is the process how video itself is uh, simplified, right? At Synthesia, when you want to create video, you simply log into our platform, you select one of the many avatars that we have available, or you can create your own avatar with, with less than 15 minutes of footage. You type any script that you'd like in 64 of the supported languages. You do any design decisions that you would like to do. You hit generate video and your video will be ready very shortly. Now, we, we do believe at Synthesia that synthetic video is a very powerful technology and as such, it should be rolled out um, in an ethical manner, right? From one side, what this means for us is that we only create someone's custom avatar with their explicit consent. 
From another perspective, this also means that we believe all of the avatars that we make available for people should be as diverse and as representative as the actual world that they, they mean to represent. So we always aim to add more and more um, AI stock avatars. Another important part of this ethical rollout is that these AI avatars who you see in our platform, they're all based on real human actors. And as such, we always make sure that when a video is generated with them, they get remunerated for that specific video. As I mentioned before, actually, we already support 64 languages. Now, this is very important, for example, for global enterprises. One of our main clients is Ernst & Young, EY, for example. And what they need to do is they need to communicate internally with their employees and externally with their clients in all of their global markets, right? And so to do so, it is just a way more efficient way to do it in the native language. Imagine how much better it is if instead of me as the human talking, I could just present this whole presentation in your native language. It's just a way better form of communication. Now, another very interesting element about synthetic media and synthetic video in, in general is that apart from traditional video, which is a linear process, all of a sudden you can have an iterative video creation process. For example, if you work with clients on a new video idea, instead of sending scripts back and forth, commenting on those, you can just simply log in create your first version with the script that you're interested in, hit generate video, send it to the client and visualize the video right away and show them what the, uh, what the capabilities of the video actually is. And you can do this again and again. Let me give you another example where this is extremely useful. Many of our clients use us for compliance videos, right? Because as, you, as many of you might know from your own experience, Many times you need to read through very boring uh, PDFs where you, you just, you know, it's a compliance document and in the cor corporation, you just need to read it. It's just a way better experience if you ask your employees to watch a video instead. Now those policies get updated time over time. With Synthesia, you can just come in, change the script really quickly and generate another video. And all of a sudden you give a 10x better experience to, their to your employees. We also provide quite extensive op opportunities for, for editing your videos, right? Synthesia Studio is an end-to-end -end video creation platform. What that means is, is that we don't just uh, provide an avatar for you, a diverse set of avatars that can generate the script and talk in your language, but you, can, you have all of the creative capabilities that you would expect from a video creation platform. You can add text, you can add animated backgrounds. Which or... can, all the creative capabilities that you would expect from a video Oops. creation platform. I do have a bit of a, an echo, but I'm, I'm sure you can hear me all right. Um, yes, and so um, what, you, what you can also do is, you know, have voice-only slides to make sure that people actually focus on your content instead of the avatar when that is needed. You can add animations and all other, um, all other editing capabilities that you would expect from uh, a video platform. And one of the biggest benefits and the part that I'm really excited about when it comes to synthetic video is that we're taking processes that will take weeks and turning it into something that you can do in minutes, right? This changes the whole way we create content. And in the future, I believe that we, it will enable us to create fully new experiences. One of the ways to actually do this is by programmatically generating out new video. And given that we've turned cameras into code, we can do, we can generate out any amount of video that we want, right? Which means that for the first time, we can truly personalize videos one-to-one -one for, um, for the audiences. One example here is a campaign that we created for PepsiCo for their brand Lays, where we created the AI avatar of Leo Messi. And after that, a, a fan could come onto the online platform, add their name, their friend's name, 
and invite them to the next game and send an invite um, with Leo Messi's video um, inviting them to, to, their, uh, to the next football game. It's just a way better experience. Now, the reason why I'm actually excited about this very much is because even as at Synthesia, we don't know what the exact formats will be. We do believe that synthetic media will bring along fully new formats, the same way how social media enabled and catalyzed so many different formats on mobile, you know, vertical video, whatever it might be. Synthetic media will also bring those new formats along. And this is why we are excited to work with such fantastic partners like yourselves, because it will be our partners yourselves who will be experimenting with all of these different formats. And another thing that we're really, really proud of at Synthesia is that synthetic video as a solution is way greener than using traditional uh, production capability. I was actually astonished when I, I looked into the details of this myself. It turns out that in London alone, the production, the traditional production industry uses as much um, energy as 24,000 homes in a year in London. That's mind blowing to me. Given that all of our servers run on renewable energy, the actual carbon footprint of our videos is minuscule compared to that. And this is to make sure that as we scale and as we grow synthetic media, we actually don't bust the planet in the process. So this is another angle in which synthetic media just gives so many better opportunities than traditional video. And we already see um, quite some results um, using synthetic video. We work with some of the largest brands in the world and we work with some uh, very fantastic celebrities um, on different campaigns. For example, um, we work with David Beckham on their Malaria No More campaign. And this one allowed David to speak in 10 African languages to make sure that he's that he shares his message around stopping malaria in their local language. I've already told you about the Lionel Messi case and with Snoop Dogg, we worked with Just Eat to localize their content without ever having uh, to, uh, to ask Snoop Dogg to do a localization project without. But we also work with companies like Google and Nike or SAP to actually create internal communications content and training materials. You know, we do believe that in 10 years time, synthetic video will enable people to create a Hollywood great movie on their laptop, but we're not there yet. Today, this technology is best suited for employee facing content and training materials. But very shortly in a year's time, we will start to see gestures coming in. We'll start to see emotional um, communications coming in and step-by-step step, we will get closer to that vision. Thank you so much for your time, and I very much look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much, Daniel Berten. Really interesting. And if you're watching this, remember the chat at YouTube. Please put your questions there. Uh, Daniel, I have a couple uh, questions from the ethical sector. Uh, one comes from the um, fact that you said, or the number you said, uh, that in five years, something like 90% of videos is going to be synthetic videos. Well, if businesses, for example, are using this kind of videos, do they, do they have like some ethical thing? Uh, do, is it polite to tell the people that they're actually watching synthetic video? Or do you think that it doesn't matter because tech technology is so good? Absolutely. So ethical considerations are, are a very big question and something that we think about day in and day out, right? We already work with thousands of companies on ensuring that synthetic video is actually implemented in an ethical way. And my answer to your specific question would be that it really depends on the case, right? The, the guiding principle in any single case that we create is that the end consumer should never be deceived about the goal of the content. But for example, in the case of uh, using Leo Messi's uh, case, it was quite obvious that it's not 
the real Messi sending you a personalized message. So for example, in that case, we didn't think it important, but normally, you know, we encourage all of our customers to start with the AI avatar saying, hi, I am an AI avatar, right? And for example, when I use my own avatar to, to present, I also start with that one. One more point on this is that, as I said, we're very early in, in the development of, um, of the technology. Today, it is quite easy to tell an AI avatar from a real human, right? This is why it's best for internal communications and for um, training purposes. And so there's no deception when it comes. The most important thing for us is more the question of explicit consent. We say no to deals all the time because someone wants to create an AI avatar of, uh, of someone else. This is only allowed when we have the explicit consent from, from that person. The other ethical question I had in mind was that, uh, do you have any kind of like a moderation policy in which kind of uses your avatars can be used? Like when you're scaling and more and more businesses and customers are going to use your technology, like uh, how do you draw the lines if someone's, for example, spreading, well, say racist content, but it's not like so in your face, but you know, uh, do you have like uh, kind of a moderation policy for these kind of situations? We absolutely do. And uh, you know, it's interesting because we do get that question time to time, but we don't see people asking the same question from Microsoft Word or Adobe Premiere Pro, right? Those platforms don't have content moderation built in, even though, you know, their content creation platform, just like Synthetic Studio, Synthesia Studio. Now, we do have very strict content moderation policies, actually, simply because we believe that the technology is so powerful that it needs to be implemented in an ethical way. So we have several layers of machine automated content moderation, and then we also have manual reviews for the more ambiguous questions. And so we have several stages of content moderation, and as we scale, you know, we keep adding more and more details around that. Uh, Synthesia has received lots of media attention this fall, for example, as I mentioned, 60 Minutes. How did you do this? <laughs> well, we're really lucky because the technology itself is quite interesting, right? And so people come to us and ask, how do we actually do this? We are quite proud of the fact that we're turning any text communication into video. And so with, uh, with cases like CBS 60 Minutes or the Wired Articles or the BBC or the Guardian, we normally, you know, we build the relationship with the journalists and then myself or Victor explain exactly what synthetic media is, what Synthesia does. And it's just a topic that really excites people right now. And we're excited about it, obviously, ourselves. Daniel Werten, thank you very, very much. Thank you. As I told you earlier, I was doing my job as a podcaster remotely for a long time in pandemic mode. And uh, I once did an interview with two Finnish researchers who were studying fandom in a context of online game Overwatch. And we, we, when we did this interview for my podcast, we actually were playing Overcast at the same time we were dis having a discussion and we were playing against each other. Uh, let's play a little audio clip. Mulla ei ole kyllä mitään saamaa nyt teitä vastaan. Mä voin siirtyä toimittajan joukkueeseen, jos se lohduttaa tätä. I'm not a young man anymore. Todi. <laughs> ja no, ah. ja sinne meni. Olihan tämä kaksi vastaa yksi, mutta hyvältä se silti tuntuu. <laughs> Knock me down and I'll keep getting back up. And if you don't understand Finnish, it doesn't matter. Because maybe you heard that I was the one who was losing all the time. It was all the time game over, man. They were great players. Uh, if you're a great gamer, you're probably really familiar with NVIDIA's GPUs. 
And if you've been following discussion on discourse around metaverse, you might be informed that NVIDIA wants to be part of creating metaverse. Our next speaker works for NVIDIA. He's going to share what NVIDIA is working on at the moment and how all this works, work connects to our subject, synthetic media. Hi, I'm Jamie Allen, Head of Media, Entertainment and Broadcast here at NVIDIA for the EMEA region. I'd like to start by giving a huge thank you to the team at YLE for inviting us here today to talk on such an exciting group of topics. NVIDIA operates at the intersection of AI, graphics and accelerated data science. So you can imagine that the topics of synthetic media generation, digital humans and conversational AI are incredibly important to us. Today I'd like to share with you some of the amazing areas that NVIDIA Research and our partners are highly invested in today and how they are both informing what's possible right now as well as what the future can look like when it comes to connected content, AI and the metaverse. I'm going to start by introducing you to some of the amazing work that NVIDIA's research groups are doing today. I am a trailblazer. I am creating new worlds to explore. Bringing our boldest visions to life. And inspiring generations of creators to come. I am expanding the limits of discovery. Evolving our knowledge with every challenge. And bridging the gap between people and machines. In case you're not I am helping us come together like never before. Adding clarity to every connection. Discovering the hidden potential in every molecule. And bringing us together to help save lives wherever we are. Even the narrator of this story. I am AI. 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 Brought to life by the researchers at NVIDIA and inspired minds everywhere. As you can see from this short sample, NVIDIA's research and engineering teams take on some of the hardest tasks in AI and work with partners around the world to incorporate these groundbreaking technologies into applications used in many industries. Let's look closer at a few of these technologies and how they're going to help us shape the paths for synthetic content generation in the media industry. And we'll start in the world of GANs. A GAN is a generative model that is trained using two neural network models. One model is called the generator, and this model learns to generate new plausible samples. The other model, called the discriminator, learns to differentiate between the generated examples and the real examples. These two models are set up in a contest where the generator model seeks to fool the discriminator model, and the discriminator is provided with both examples of real and generated samples. After training, the generative model can then be used to create new plausible samples on demand. Here, you've seen examples of Gaugan and the application we released for it called Canvas. We're focused on generating amazing landscape images based on a user input where you define the characteristics of a scene with a simple doodle and the Gan model does the rest. This tool can now be used by creators for inspiration or to create elements of a scene which can then be added to their own work. Another well-known GAN tool from NVIDIA's research teams is known as StyleGAN. The use case often presented for this network is the generation of human and animal faces, as you can see in these demonstrations. They can be lifelike or heavily stylized depending on how the network has been trained, 
However, many artists have utilized this and other similar technologies to create amazing AI generated artwork and products like you see in these examples. The latest iteration of StyleGAN, StyleGAN 3, which we released in October 2021, shows huge improvements over the previous approaches, as you can see in these side-by-side -side examples where the previous and new versions are trained on the same dataset. It's truly amazing how quickly we are seeing advances in this area of content generation. When NVIDIA's researchers turn their attention to natural language processing and conversational AI, the results are equally staggering. In 2017, we presented a method of audio-driven facial animation by joint end-to-end -end learning of pose and emotion. Are those Eurasian footwear cowboy chaps or jolly earth-moving headgear? This is my reality, and this is the reality of my people. What we're seeing here is AI-driven facial animation just from a one audio source, allowing us to create synthetic characters animated by recorded or AI-generated audio. We've now built this technology into an application called audio to face as part of NVIDIA's Omniverse platform. Euh, moi j'ai tendance à ne pas trop euh, m'enflammer parce que euh, je sais que ce ne sont que des matchs de préparation. Euh, ce sont des adversaires qui étaient à notre portée, mais sont, sont, sont de genre de, de match qui, euh, qui justement nous servent à bien peaufiner justement un schéma tactique de trouver euh, des corps. So now the picture is starting to come together. We can generate high quality synthetic imagery of just about anything given enough good quality data, including humans. We can generate conversation and turn it into emotive speech, which then animates a 2D or 3D character in real time. One other piece of the puzzle I'd like to look at today is applying these GAN approaches to full 3D objects. NVIDIA researchers have created a powerful breakthrough for 2D to 3D models. Now it's possible to create a 3D animatable model with a single 2D picture no 3D modeling software or experience required. It's automatic and easy. We call it Ganverse 3D. Ready to see this groundbreaking tech in action? We uploaded a picture of Kit, the iconic 1980s AI car from Knight Rider, and brought it to 21st century AI-powered life. Knight Industries 2000 here in full 3D. I think that got their attention, Michael. Learn more at the link in our bio. Omniverse really captured my good side. All of them. Ganverse is just one example of how NVIDIA are applying cutting edge deep learning techniques to 3D worlds. There are many uses in our research fields for generating synthetic data with these techniques not least because in order to train and refine AI models, huge amounts of data is required. If we are able to synthetically generate high quality data and variations on original data, it becomes much easier to create these amazing AIs with applications in healthcare, automotive, manufacturing and media, amongst many other industries. So how does all of this connect together? Where do we envisage this intersection of AI, graphics and computing supporting the creation of content for the future of broadcasting and metaverse experiences? Well, to start with, NVIDIA itself needed a platform in which we can connect artists, engineers and researchers to a shared 3D world. A world in which open standards are used to ensure interoperability and collaboration can work seamlessly. Both for our own use and for the use of our customers in many industries, we've built Omniverse.
These examples are just some of the amazing things that people are starting to do with the power of this platform and the ethos of open shared worlds, which can be supported by AI and data science. We're seeing BMW simulating an entire production factory before breaking ground to drive efficiencies and optimization. Architects like Foster and Partners collaboratively designing buildings around the world and running complex light and heat simulations in real time. Training and testing autonomous vehicles with our DriveSim group. WPP, the world's largest media and content creation company, building virtual sets for filming advertisements, collaborating in real time with clients and using AI to create new iterations of content. As well, of course, in the broadcasting industry, where we're seeing groups within the IBC Accelerator program like RAI, YLE and RTE use Omniverse's tools to create new innovative ways of collaborating on content creation. For 3D artists, as you can see in this example, not only are we able to create amazing visuals right inside the Omniverse applications, such as Create and View, we're able to collaborate in real time on building a scene or asset between multiple artists anywhere in the world. Here, we see a user in 3ds Max, Photoshop and Omniverse contributing to this beautiful landscape scene. Because of the way we've built the Omniverse Nucleus service, with its collaboration and live sync capabilities, you can even have virtual actors and virtual cameras in different parts of the world contributing to a performance being rendered and viewed in another location with very low latency. NVIDIA's Omniverse is a powerful multi-GPU, real-time simulation and collaboration platform for 3D production pipelines based on Pixar's Universal Scene Description and NVIDIA RTX technology. Omniverse enables universal interoperability across different applications and 3D ecosystem vendors. It provides efficient, real-time scene updates and is based on open standards and protocols. The Omniverse platform is designed to act as a hub enabling new capabilities to be exposed as microservices to any connected clients and applications. We see Omniverse, amongst many things, as one of the building blocks which will enable both an industrial and consumer metaverse experience. Platforms which allow content to be created, rendered and delivered in real time, whilst pulling information from many sources and injecting the results into many delivery streams, give creators new abilities where synthetic content will play a huge role. If we now introduce technologies and concepts like recommendation engines, driving hyper-personalization capabilities, we'll be able to generate both 2D and 3D content with AI that is designed for an individual or small groups. TV shows, games and movies can be driven by AI decisions based on broad complex storylines, which, in a basic form, could deliver personalised versions of original content, or build entirely synthetic content driven by your own decisions and inputs to an AI. Content would no longer need to be pre-built to populate 3D worlds. Objects, entire cities even, could be generated on the fly and contain within them AI characters and human avatars which speak with AI-generated voices. Or you can choose your own voice thanks to companies such as Respeecher. Platforms like Synthesias could be delivering huge swathes of content that you consume in any language you need with little to no effort. Fashion designers, architects, product designers will all be able to leverage platforms and systems to create, augment and adapt their work based on real-time feedback from consumers and all of that content would sit in this shared 3D space. Now, of course, much of what we've talked about here today is still research or purely theoretical, but many of the jigsaw pieces are there to complete the picture. In a time not too far away, along with innovative broadcasters like Wiley and the geniuses at companies like Respeecher and Synthesia, we will be able to help realize these platforms together in the best way possible. Thank you very much for your time today, and I look forward to speaking to you further. Thanks, Jamie Allen. That was really, really interesting. And I have to ask one really important question. Was it good old Microsoft Paint you were using when you were controlling the AI while building landscapes? Uh, no, that, that's an entirely... Uh, 
built application by NVIDIA. Okay, cool. Nice it, to know. It, it looks a little bit like MS Paint, but the idea of that application is to allow a very simple interface uh, yeah. to an a show you the AI creating amazing landscapes. Yeah, cool. But you shouldn't underestimate the power of paint. Oh, no, no, never. Yeah. <laughs> we all know dangers of deep fakes and fake news powered by technology. Uh, how is NVIDIA working at the moment to prevent, prevent this kind of use? So uh, NVIDIA finds itself in a position where we are one of the world leaders in creating this sort of technology. The, the underlying research and uh, advancements that are used by companies like well, everyone else who's appeared here today, right? Um, because of that, we are also find ourselves involved in number of initiatives to ensure that deep fakes, fake news, and the negative uses of uh, deep fakes and synthetic media can be addressed by news organizations, can be addressed by governments and uh, just making society safe with, with these technologies. So there's, there's, there are a number of initiatives that NVIDIA's research teams are involved in to help uh, tackle these areas. Uh, this question came from the audience. So how do we define real in future? It could be hard. Um, I think when we, when we cross the line where humans can no longer perceive uh, a, a synthetic piece of media from a real piece of media, we have to start being very careful about how and where these are used. The individuals, the consumers have a better understanding of these technologies. We aren't there yet. We are getting close, certainly in 2D, not in 3D. Um, you know, to have someone look like me that is completely synthetically generated, acts like me and things like this is, is still very, very hard. Um, so being able to define what's real and, and what is synthetic is going to be down to those content creators and people who are delivering that content to ensure that their consumers are in a position of knowledge and trust. There is also a coming question concerning watermarks. Do you have, uh, do we need that kind of technology in future, for example? What's your answer? I think it could certainly make sense. I think that the, the underlying technologies, the engines that generate these uh, the synthetic content could easily have those sorts of safeguards and tools included in them, um, which would be very hard to undo. When you look at how deep the layers of uh, technology are in the synthetic content generation engines, the deeper you place those safeguards, the harder they would be to remove from the content once it's been created. One more question, uh, <laughs> and at first I asked about the real now. One more easy question: How do you how do you define synthetic media? I think it's very broad in NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA creates and works with many types of synthetic media. Um, you know, we, as I said in the video, we create huge amounts of synthetic media for training other AIs. So for us, any media that is generated by an engine that is, has the knowledge of how to create that media is, is synthetic. And that could be audio, that could be visual, that could be 3D that could be text, it could be code, right? We, we have AIs now generating programs, writing technology, designing hardware. Um, the generation of all of this data is synthetic. It's being driven by an AI, but ultimately those AIs are mostly trained by humans. Jamie Allen, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Great to speak to you. So, it's time for panel discussion. <laughs> uh, we're going to have a different perspective to our subject, subject, synthetic media. And I have a pleasure to have three awesome experts with me on a stage. And they have promised to share their professional views and thoughts on this subject. So, great to have you here with us. Anna Vuopala, Anna-Mari Rusala, Alisa Bura. Uh,
maybe we should start with a little introduction round. So who are you and what are you working on at the moment? If you could, Alisa, for example, chair, sure. start. So I am doing my PhD in uh, Tampere University. And uh, my topic is uh, industrial collaboration in virtual environments. And basically what I'm trying to do is to understand how technology can aid people in their processes and make our work more efficient and faster and maybe even more engaging. aspects of cognitive intelligence systems, including AI and stuff. I also work as a senior specialist on ethical, societal, and scientific aspects of AI in public ICT, Ministry of Finance, Finnish government. Okay, so we have a little technical problem, so if you could just briefly tell, uh, <laughs> tell the same again. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. Is it okay now? Do we have sound? Okay, maybe we're trying to fix the sound. Is it your sound working, maybe? Yeah, so, yes. so, okay. uh, <laughs> oh, <whoops. laughs> so my name Double is sound. Uh, Anna Vuapala. I work with the Ministry of Education and Culture in Finland with copyright for the last 20 years. And uh, recently really working on uh, the copyright infrastructure, which is uh, it's a way to, to improve the identification of works and authors in the, in the digital environment. And that's really key uh, to make the copyright system work actually. I mean, it doesn't really work really well at the moment, so we are working on the data um, management practices and data sharing practices in the creative sectors in order to make it better. And I think here, what we've heard today, um, synthetic media could really benefit from that. Yeah. So, so I'm really glad to be here. Thanks. How many times in a month you have to say that, well, the technology is advancing, but the legis legislation size is not? <laughs> Well, I mean, that's an interesting question because I'm not necessarily, I get the questions, but I'm not answering yeah. like always that the legislation is lacking <laughs> because it's true sometimes, but not all the time. I think a lot is also uh, to do with data and really the practical application of the law as it is, and it's not working really well at the moment. So I think there's the two sides, the legislation, but also the practical application that should be, you know, you know lifted to the 20th, 21st century, let's say. Is uh, Anna Maris mic on testing testing? I have no idea. No, we don't have sound yet. Do we have any? Okay, we're gonna have a microphone, new one to the stage. <laughs> we can't synthesize your answer yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> that requires time. Let's see. Okay, did you put it on? Okay, it should be on. Okay. Hey. Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Real audio, not synthetic. Yes. So I'm Anna-Mari Rusanen. I work as a university lecturer in the University of Helsinki. I'm a lecturer of cognitive science. And I also work in um, as a senior specialist on ethical and societal and scientific aspects of AI in, in Ministry of Finance here in um, Finnish governance. And nice to be here. Do you remember the mind map or list of hashtags I told before earlier? Uh, the one which was collected by Ula Innovations. Uh, did you find anything from that list which would be very uh, particularly interesting from your point of view? If you could, for example, start, Alice. Uh, like most of them, or okay. all of them. <laughs> <laughs> if you so could, it would one be or hard, two. but uh, in general, like the role of how technology shaped the society, I think that's maybe important. And it interlinks in all the keywords like future presenter, future what it was, actor, future influencers, yeah. like all these things like synthesized media, text generated, pictures, videos. I think like we are at the era when our things going to change and they're going to change dramatically. And I, I would not return to the keywords individually. But yeah, okay. Our, we will see the shift and we are responsible for making it positive for us and bringing in the actual value. That would be my message for the key list. And one more point for your key list that there was a gaming environment. Yes. I really would like to extend it to other virtual environments because it's also very important and not only in gaming. And this kind of XR with the help of synthetic media is going to boost. Yeah, that's 
like what we are expecting. Anna Mari, Anna. Well, I chose the word weird. Given weird. That yes. Weird. <laughs> That's because my choice also. When I was listening to these guys, Jamie and other representatives from these uh, companies, and when the issue of what is real emerges, it's obviously a very fundamental, philosophical, interesting, metaphysical question. But okay, this is a moment for a philosopher of science and philosopher in general when. Um, the classics from our history meets the modern technology. And I can imagine how Plato, if he was alive today, would say that, oh boys, I didn't mean exactly this when I wrote my allegory of caves. And Descartes would say that, okay, now I have a headache, <laughs> given that, okay, we are trying to replicate and sub substitute our reality with this virtual reality. And the whole business and industry is led by companies, industries, and we are just saying, wow, this is magical, magical technology. So I agree with Alisa and many others that these technologies, they can have a very beneficial use. It can be really mind blowing, but at the same time, we should be ready to ask those questions that, okay, is this really what we want? And if we want this, what do we exactly want? Good point, Anna. Yeah, so I, I chose two, two okay. of those, uh, future actors and GAN, so general adversarial networks, uh, meaning, I think, uh, creating new human beings. And th those were very interesting. I mean, the first one, of course, uh, obviously, is that it uh, changes the creative sectors, and per particular for the f performers, you know, it looks like they're losing their jobs. Uh, at least to, to, to the, some extent, but I know that that's not the case probably, um, you know, in a long time. But, you know, the five-year prediction just now with the 90% of, of all video being synthetic, well, seems a little bit that there is a risk <laughs> that they are losing their jobs. And, of course, that's not a, it's a nice, not, not a nice thing, and I think it's, it's, copyright has to do with that. Copyright is really important. It's a part of... of empowering uh, individuals by their creative activity, but also ensuring that they get uh, remunerated for, for their work. Uh, the GAN uh, is kind of interesting that it would be a work if it would, would be by a person. But I understand, I'm not sure, because I don't know about these systems, are these persons actually being developed by the individuals themselves? Then that could be a work. I mean, in principle, a human being could be a work which, uh, you know, it's, it's quite, quite new. Normally, uh, features like sound and appearance of persons are not creative works. Uh, they are not protected by copyright because, uh, well, they are natural, and they don't, you know, they are not, uh, maybe God or someone else, you know, has been the major creator. But, but uh, so these are really confusing terms. Um, and I want to be positive about them. So I think uh, we need to focus on the positives and enable this, uh, technology that is here, uh, AI, to the benefit of the copyright system, you know, to make the IP system work in a way that we can address these issues in a positive way. I think that's the most, that's the key. So keep it positive, but only by working on data and data management. So I think that's it. By the way, uh, did you see the conversation? I think it was in Great Britain or Australia, I'm not sure. But there was a discussion that if there is, for example, a research or study, uh, and there is uh, AI, some AI model highly involved in the study. They were discussing should the AI model itself should be credited as a mm. kind of a researcher. Do you have you seen that kind of discussion? Yeah. What do you think about that? Maybe someone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> well, I, I would say a researcher is is, a, is an author in the same way as anybody else. So researching is uh, you know writing writing. Uh, a literary work, more or less. So when you are an author, you have moral rights, and moral rights include being credited. But the, if this is an AI algorithm who is providing this content there, and then there are human uh, creators also, then there is, uh, you know, and this can be separated from each other. I would not, I would say that they don't have a right to be credited, but of course they can be credited yet. Yes, <laughs> if we are nice to them. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> but of course, the minimum requirement is that the 
algorithm is described in, in the article mm. or the published yeah. result so that everybody can take a look at it and so on. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, do you remember, it was 2017, the deep fake Obama thing? Do you remember? It was a, there was a video produced by researchers at the Washing, uh, Washington University, and they used their technology to model the mouth of Mr. Obama, and they were literally able to put words into his mouth. Uh, I think that was one of the first time when people were like seeing this kind of te technology, and it kind of started the discussion around deep fakes. What do you think about this kind of start for this branch of technology in the, fa in the um, eyes of wider audience? Very wrong start, probably. <laughs> yeah. I think people always reject novelty or novel innovations that are coming in. As far as I remember, people was rejecting electricity when it just came. So uh, the question actually, like, do we want it? Maybe we don't even have right to say. It's just developing and we just follow it. So. Uh, what we was about Obama. Looking at these artificially um, generated videos, I think uh, most of people maybe have this uh, little buzz like something is wrong. S something is like you, get, you get it naturally. And uh, this is called Uncanny Valley. Uh, you have this sense like when you see that something is like not nearly as realistic, you can understand it. So I think. Uh, that's why people get this negative like reaction to the technology itself. And I think the way to introduce these novel technologies is to actually start from explaining values, what it takes to develop those technologies. Then we go, of course, to risks and drawbacks as well. And then we deliver this message to everyone and everybody gets it. Then we can show examples, I think, only this kind of order, that we show that there is a lot of potential, there is a bit of drawbacks, we can fight them, So, and there is how we're going to use it to make our life better. Well, I hopefully make our life better. <laughs> <laughs> Any other yeah, Yes, I agree that the Obama case, it kind of nailed the risk-based approach on the, on the deep fakes, given that uh, you are doing a parody or a deep fake on the, probably the most power, powerful a person uh, in the world, so it was kind of obvious that the outcome will be the negative, the negative discussion on the possible harms and, and, and uh, risks and so on. And I think that generally this industry, uh, it really needs a um, developed good quality discussion on the positive outcomes of this technology. I was really glad to see that all these guys who were presenting the technological uh, gadgets or whatever, they were mentioning the kind of uh, impact to climate change and, and the localization issue, is, which is really important in the context of, of the global world and so on. But anyway, we, we really need, I think, not only, of course, in the case of synthetic media, but, but the whole tech industry, the discussion on the, on the basic motivation for developing this technology, using it, and also on the way how we frame the whole, whole business, in a sense, yes. And when lawyers saw the, the Obama, you were like, oh my God, the copyright issues, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's uh, obviously, uh, I don't know, is the first thing is a copyright issue, but is it more like, like, uh, like the deep fake, the fact that you are uh, replicating a human being and, and putting false words in their mouth? That, I that is not a not copyright yeah, uh, issue, not. but it's, it's a data protection issue, a privacy issue. You, 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 you got, might get uh, you know, claims of, of defamatory uh, speech about somebody and things like that. Uh, I think it's interesting that they talk about ethical approach when it's actually a legal yes. issue. Mm -hmm. So it's not an ethical. Ethical is kind of like soft. Uh, we have laws that say that they need to uh, protect uh, personals, personal data. They need to protect copyright. So it would be interesting to know what kind of IP strategies do they have for their own uh, work, what they are doing when they are developing these AI services. And this is also linked with the ethics of AI and the transparency of algorithms, because algorithms are not uh, copyrighted. I mean, they, they can't get co copyright protection, but they are obviously very valuable as, as an intellectual asset for the company. And, then, and this is the kind of the risk that there needs to be transparency about what this um, 
algorithm uh, has been eating, you know, like mm. what, what training data is there, what has it been taught to do, and then how is that protected from that company's point of view. Mm. And then we have the user who d then makes these nice videos. So what is their uh, copyright, so, or what, what is their creative activity? Does the originality criterion actually, uh, be, is it fulfilled? And it depends really a lot about the creative choices that you have in that process. I mean, can you, uh, can you choose uh, freely, you know, what you are doing and what kind of video you're doing? And when you exercise it, you know, the, the, there are input from the AI. And, you know, how many choices can you make in order for it to become uh, a creative work? And that's, that's, uh, it's a process that actually we all have to think about. But the, normally it's, uh, it's the user of that end product that actually uh, faces the challenge, let's say, is this a protected work or isn't it? Whose is it? Do I need a permission from whom? And so forth. The person who made it, it's a presumed author. They are presumed to be the author and, and that's good for them, of course, but it doesn't really bring anything from the copyright side. They are not getting the funds or the remuneration unless the user first found, finds them. So this is the copyright infrastructure issue as well. It's so like you identify yourself, you identify the, the, the work, and then the user can reach you and get licensed and you know, everything uh, smooth, uh, is smoothly working out. So these are really well, interesting questions, but thanks. Yeah. Okay, let's dive deeper into your professional view. Okay, we have been, oh. <laughs> we have been hearing <laughs> less about that, but uh, I'd like to ask, uh, how do you think synthetic media might affect your field of work in the future? Shall I? Okay. Yeah. Well, of course, from a cogn cognitive science point of view, it will raise a lot of interesting questions. For example, concerning the relationship between a man as a user and the machine as a, as a user interface, and also somebody uh, with or something that you uh, interact with. It is a kind of novel form of cognitive uh, division of labor that may have really remarkable research questions. For example, do our, our cognitive systems react in different way when we are operating in a, in a synthetic virtual environment com compared to the real world environment? If so, in what way? How it will impact, to say, our, our brains? What, what about the young people who <laughs> probably are going to be the, the uh, most um, probable users of that kind of uh, virtual environment. Mm -hmm. uh, how, uh, what kind of impacts from a neuro, neuro point of view this um, environment will have to them, their brains and so on. So there is a, a group of fascinating um, research questions related to the cognitive part of, part of the story. From ethical and societal point of view, of course, this will be a huge set of problems and challenges and, and also um, the challenge of framing the whole discussion in a, in a fruitful or fertile way. The risk-based talk, it won't get uh, us away to go very far. So a lot of work <laughs> will be waiting somebody I, to do it. I yeah. completely agree. I was thinking about the same, like if we are doing research, where we see how people interact with technologies. So when technologies develop, it means that we have more research to do and find <laughs> novel things and then see how they interact with each other, connect and link and so on. But I would like to maybe open this question from the VR perspective, because it's like uh, the topic is very close to my heart. VR is the exciting technology that actually bring me to research, like initially. And uh, this uh, rise of synthetic Synthetic media, what is that <laughs> um, It brings a lot of opportunities for the development of the system. Nowadays, it's, co it's costly, it's resource not efficient mm -hmm. <laughs> in that way. It takes like months mm. and people, lots of people, team of work to make one virtual space, for example, mm. detailed detail that would look like reality. While, as far as I understand, no technologies can make it like in a minutes or weeks. So. Can you imagine how it can boost the development of these things? And once it is more developed, 
uh, there will be more interesting things coming. Like people start like this metaverse. People will jump in metaverse in five years. It's going to be absolutely different from what we imagine today because things going to get going to get developed and develop further. They get, no, never going to stop at the point that we think. There will be new layers of information, new layers of things, of ethical consideration, of legal considerations. <laughs> so, yeah, lots of exciting work, I would say. Yeah, can I? I wanted to uh, react to this. Uh, you, you, you mentioned again about this, you know, that we have to start a positive kind of, or it would be a much better mm -hmm. approach to these issues to to have, you know, a, a space for for this positive. Uh, uh, thinking around uh, synthetic media. I think this would be, this is an, a great opportunity, you know, there's a kickoff, let's say, of, of that work. But also we could use uh, some form of synthetic media uh, um, as a use case for the copyright infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because it would, it, it links, uh, it's not a, you know, like an island in itself. I mean, in data infrastructures are being developed all over. So you have like circular economy data infrastructure, you have uh, real-time economy infrastructure, you have all the kind of infrastructures that you know, necessarily needs to be linked to each other. So then uh, you know, to have a you know, case for the synthetic media, which would have features from copyright, uh, data protection, um, personality rights, uh, and, and consumer issues, and you, you, would, you would find, you know, a set of use cases, and then we could look, you know, what happens to them, how, how the copyright uh, infrastructure could solve, you know, these cases. But with the use of AI, with the use of uh, blockchain, uh, distributed ledger technologies that provide the trust to this data. That's the whole problem in the copyright, because we don't have a registration system. We don't have someone, an authority that says that, oh great, you made this work, and you are you. You know, it's, we don't have that. So we have to use what is you know, now being developed, these uh, self-sovereign identities and identifiers uh, for each works. And then when they are combined, then we have something of, you know, something that we can trust. So are you talking about opportunities using NFTs in context of synthetic media? <laughs> that's another, yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. And I think that's, that's great that we have that, you know, because it, it definitely, like a first time ever, brings some sort of value to the digital copy mm -hmm. of a work, you know, which normally has no value because it's yeah. detached, you know, from the... Mm -hmm. It can be copied and you can distribute it, you know, without any, any effort at all. So I think it's great, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a question from the chat. Oh. How should Finland protect its society and democracy from the potential threats of somebody using synthetic media to affect the general opinion of people, for example, in elections? You know, well, of course, um, in Finland, at the end of the day, it is the legislation that will do, do the trick. And uh, as far as I know, for example, the European Commission is planning an, an, uh, regula regulative actions uh, that would, uh, for example, force uh, companies to mark whether they use deepfakes and, and they are preparing legislation. Of course, uh, laws can't do everything. There is a lot of more that must be done, given that, that there are certain specific threats or risks that are really, really serious on the, with the case of, of synthetic media. I'm not so worried about the so-called epistemic loss argument, which means that, that uh, the more we use uh, deepfakes and synthetic media, the m uh, less reliable uh, video-based or um, image-based evidence or audio-based evidence become. I don't think that this is the real problem. The real problem, a real game-changer, will be the situation when deepfakes and synthetic media is combined together, for example, with recommendation algorithms mm -hmm. or other tools of ma for manipulation and to, to co govern and control people. How to uh, tackle that challenge? Well, I don't know. We need a lot of education on these, these topics. We need responsible companies who recognize this threat and are ready to use everything that is in their power to st stop the development. And, and we need all of us to, to get the sufficient knowledge on these matters and, you know, build a society that is 
uh, that is um, major enough to, to handle the situation. But it, as I see it, it is a real problem or a possible problem. Alisa had something on her Yeah, mind. I would like to point out that whenever we have some problem associated with technology, we can again apply technology to solve it. And uh, I read articles, and there is many of them who say that actually they already created code which can track if the content was generated by human or by artificial intelligence. And what we need to do is to integrate it to all the services we are using. So it can be as ad block but just mm. like synthetic media block. I don't know, create a <laughs> oh, that's great interesting name. Idea. But this is a reality, this is what's going to happen. It's like, it's not like there is a threat and nobody working to kind of like uh, minimize their harmful effects or to like stop them completely. There is a work, a big field is doing that. And I'm pretty sure that it's going to come to the market or to our like customer use like soon, as long as there will be more uh, these kind of videos available because it's not yet there. You, you see like these companies who was presenting, they have these technologies for themselves mostly and like just an ordinary human, I don't think they can just get to do anything like this yet. Of course, like in, you don't know what will happen in one year. There can be like some leakage or whatever, yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, no, I was listening so closely, so I don't have anything <laughs> to add. Yeah, okay. But yeah, thank you very much. It's been very interesting to hear your thoughts. Uh, Anna Vuopala, Alisa Purova, Anna-Mari Rusanen, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And that's it, folks. You've been watching first ever Blow Your Mind event by Yle Innovations, and hopefully your mind is even a little bit blown. Uh, big thanks to everybody who's participating, making this event happen. And for the Finnish people, uh, Finnish speaking audience, check Yle Arena, search Juuso Pekkinen, that's my podcast. If you're interested in following uh, Yle Innovations, uh, please go to LinkedIn and you find them there. Have a nice weekend and remember, magic. <laughs>